understand. Huh, strange. Okay, cool. Let's get started. So, uh, hey, everybody, thanks for watching. We're just going to get started a little bit early here because we're, uh, we're raring to go and everything's working, so let's, let's, just, let's just do it. Uh, hey, everybody, thanks for watching. This is Be Better Golf Live. We're doing a Google Hangout YouTube Live version of it. So we're going to get to your questions in a few minutes, but we're going to start off with some of my questions. Uh, Tony and I did this thing called – Tony and I and World, uh, World Long Drive Champion Jeff Flagg did this thing called uh, Building Your Reactionary Golf Swing. And I didn't tell Jeff about this, but I will send him an invite later and uh, <laughs> see wherever he is if he wants to pop in. Uh, so we did this thing called Building Your Reactionary Golf Swing. It's been a huge success for us. Uh, as far as attracting people to this golf swing philosophy. Just quick rundown. I've uh, interviewed a lot of different golf teachers, and building your reactionary golf swing for me has been, uh, or as far as the reactionary golf swing that, that Tony has put together, has been without a doubt the biggest up ramp in my game, the biggest way that I've improved. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, Tony, is uh, have you read that book Every Shot Counts and kind of got into some of the new analytics and like how to improve your scoring? Uh, Brendan, actually, you kind of broke up there. Honestly, not. And the only reason why is just four or four months of uh, PhD work this past semester. I got to the end and I was like, my first opportunity to get a 4.0 for a semester with PhD classes with a research project, with golf schools, with reactionary golf and, and the Be Better Golf School. So it was like one of those, like, I just just buried myself in my textbook. So I haven't read anything other than, you know, the research that we've been doing and what I need to do to get a 4.0. And knock on wood, uh, 4.0, first time ever, PhD. That's really good. But you did say to me that you probably could have made like a 3.8 and not quite had to almost kill yourself doing it, huh? Yeah, I did find out that physiological stress or mental does have physiological attributes. So we did have a little bit of some, some sharp pains, heart pains there. But um, I don't know. It's just one of those things. I want to be able to – I had a very challenging semester, and I just wanted to see if I could do it. It was more of a personal goal. It wasn't, wouldn't affect my, any of my programming. Right. So it was like – I wanted to do this for myself because I just wanted to see if I could do it. And then uh, we did it. We did it. So it was great. You know, what's so, real cool too with all this. I know we jump in channels, but I just want to say hi to Jordan. He was at the uh, Be Better Golf School. And uh, Svan is actually from Sweden. He's uh, uh, going to be a reactionary golf certified uh, in Sweden. He's uh, our first UK, well, I say UK, our first European. Uh, reactionary golf coach over there so he, okay cool so he's a golf teacher that's interested in in helping people learn the reactionary golf swing right cool all right so um tony the, so the one thing i wanted to talk to you as far as full swing the premise for that book that i was talking about is uh th that i could see is that a lot of people like if you talk to pros and things that, like they'll just tell you oh go practice your short game go practice your short game but really the thing that separates the, the, the bad players and the good players are the good players are able to be more accurate from further away. And um, what do you think the role between full swing and short game is as far as improvement? Or is it so specific to each person that there really is nothing general to say about it? Well, I kind of look at it this way, and this actually comes from the long drive aspect. If, if we can hit the ball well off the tee, okay, because we're swinging faster, we have to be better. Our, act, our mechanics have to be better. So if you think of it, the analogy I use is like a race car. Okay, mm -hmm. we got my car, and then we got, okay, a Formula One car. They, they, four tires, engine, transmission, steering wheel, the whole thing. But why can that vehicle go so much faster around corners? Well, the way it's designed. So if you have a driver swing that you can go fast and hit the ball straight, that means you your mechanics are that much better. Everybody can swing a, a wedge and hit the ball pretty straight. But that same mechanics may not hold up when you hit a driver. So I really believe that the driver swing is kind of paramount in order to, to, to facilitate the rest of your game. 
Now putting obviously is a little bit different because it's it's more about touch and feel. So for me, I, you got to be a good driver of the golf ball. And I think that's what you see on tour. Um, you know, unless certain courses fit the shorter hitters. So um, Matt Kuchar, for example, really doesn't hit it very far. He's my height. He's not going to win on some of these longer golf courses when you got a Dustin Johnson or Rory and some of these other guys out there that bomb it. So it, it just, to me, the better driver you can be, the better the long game is, it makes the rest of your swing better, which then facilitates in lower scores. Yeah. So one question that, that has come up with the reactionary golf swing that people naturally ask is uh, they'll say, okay, well, whose golf swing on tour does these things that you're talking about in the reactionary golf swing? And, and who, if you are trying to do uh, the reactionary golf swing, uh, which, which people on tour do you like to follow? Both tours. I'd say the men and the women and the seniors. Um, I, the, the men's tour, the first one I have that comes to mind is Louis Oosthuizen. And he actually did a video show with Holly Saunders talking about how he starts the downswing with his right arm in order to control it, even though the other players talk about their body and that. He goes, he just, I just don't do that. But it actually goes back even further. It goes back to Marco Mera back when he was winning the Masters, back when Tiger first came out, they were talking about the right arm and the arm swing starting in the downswing. So this is actually, I've been using this for 20-some years, I, and it was difficult for people to accept because we couldn't see it. You know, until we got into the, the EMG studies and, the, and understanding how neuromotor control works, do we understand that the, the mind has to tell the body to go before we actually see it to go. And that's the essence of reactionary golf. So you got Louie out there, and I saw one of the messages. Uh, I guess Sergio is doing some right-hand-only rehearsals. I've seen a lot of guys do right-hand-only swings, just practice swings and stuff like that. Uh, Henrik Stenson. Um, I think – I don't know if Niles is, sent me a message the other day. We are talking about this. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's – uh, Henrik Stenson's one of them. I've heard Jason Day talk a little bit about his arm swing. But Louie is the one I know for sure, along with Mark Romero, that came out and said the importance of the right arm to start the downswing. But it's not the fanfare of what you see in uh, kinematics, and no one could see it. It's like they just – everyone dismissed it. Yeah, one of the things that makes uh, the reactionary golf swing difficult for people to grasp is slow motion video on TV. Yep. And today on, uh, on the PGA Tour or Golf Channel or whatever – they have like literally a thousand frames and up a second of people's slow motion swings. Tell us, tell me how the uh, advent and the proliferation of slow motion cameras has kind of changed the golf instruction industry. Uh, it, unfortunately, a lot of times it, it's a negative because what when you break apart uh, kind of the whole motion you start seeing these little idiosyncrasies that may or may not have an effect on the golf club. Movement variability is common. So for an example, and this goes back to the 1930s with uh, Dr. Bernstein out of Russia. He was the first one to use like pictures to, to, to have somebody hammer. Well, the, even though you're there striking that nail every time solid, the movement patterns were always a little bit variable. And that's just normal. That's just how we operate. And there's, not going to get into why but a lot of it has to do with protection mechanisms and make sure we don't wear out the same part of our body but it's just movement variability is not a bad thing and a lot of movement variability does not affect the outcome of the golf club and what ends up happening with the slow motion videos is golf instructors will take a, a piece and say okay this is what this is what you got to do to move the golf club yeah but really what is that contribution um to move in the golf club. Dr. Ferdinand's out of Sydney, Australia. He's done some phenomenal modeling. And, you know, it just shows that, you know, through impact, the arms are producing 85% of the club head motion. And we're not seeing the contribution of the body moving the club. So the computer modeling along with is kind of disputing that along with the EMG stuff. So unfortunately, 
it's it, it, we, we were becoming too uh, mechanical, too much a, a, a paralysis by analysis with slow motion video. I think it can be used properly, but I think a lot of times it's overused in the wrong way, unfortunately. All right. Uh, that brings me to my next question for you. And guys, anybody watching this, if you're watching this and you don't have Building Your Reactionary Golf Swing, which is this video series that Tony, his star student Jeff Flagg and I uh, put together, there's a special discount code for it that I'll, that I'll give to you if you email me, bdivorce76 at gmail.com. Just say you saw this live hangout and I'll get it for you. One of the cool things about being uh, getting building your reactionary golf swing is you get on inside the golf lab, which is Tony's uh, whole website that has all these different scientific papers, like the one he was just talking about, and it also gives you access to Tony himself, and he'll do a uh, swing analysis for you and continuing ones throughout the life of your membership. One thing I wanted to ask you, Tony, about so you were a golf instructor only, like Correct. a professional golf instructor. And then, and now you're a uh, uh, PhD candidate and a master's student. And so what, one thing that I wondered about with this uh, kind of change and evolution for your career is, has there been anything in uh, the scientific world and the modeling of the golf swing that has changed your mind about the way you used to teach the golf swing before you got into, uh, went back to school? Oh yeah, definitely. One of the, the things on the takeaway and then um, is how much should the shaft rotate on the backswing? I mean, I've taught for years toe up on the way back. The shaft parallel, the ground, the toe is straight up. You know, but, so that's the, one of the first things. And I think I read it first in Dr. Steven Nesbitt's paper, talk about how better players had zero to negative shaft rotation through impact. And that was like when the light came on, and this was like in 07, and it was like, oh, oh my gosh, the shaft's not rotating. That's where the hammer came in and everything else made sense because now that club face stayed square to its arc instead of opening, and then now your re so-called release doesn't really release that way. So now we got into wrist extension and flexion without shaft rotation. Exactly, yeah. So that was one of the biggest things. And I think now that we're looking in further into it, it's how the muscles load and unload. And, you know, they're not rubber bands. And, and I, so that's where I think the next wave is coming, is understanding how the neuromuscular system works to create more efficient movement. And less hip rotation through impact but more force being delivered into the ball. So we got several things that we're dealing with, but club face rotation is the biggest thing right now. Yeah, that's one, one of the questions that I have written down for you is about this club face rotation. One of the, uh, actually a lot of the different teachers that were, were in this uh, uh, instructional documentary that I did called The Source of Power all agreed that the power, they, didn't, they had different reasons of why they thought it was, but they all agreed that really the power should come from an, an initiation of the upper body and then letting the lower body react to that. But the one thing they didn't agree on uniformly was this shaft rotation it, through as far as being toe up in the back straight and then, then close and, and in particular this closing on the way through. What I'm wondering, Tony, is because the weight, this isn't a perfect idea because this is a, a, a putter, but it's the idea. Because the weight is all on this side of the shaft, do you need to feel some, some twisting or closing to fight the force of this weight being pushed that way, or is it negligible? What do you think? No, I think there is some, and I, th and I think you still see some shaft rotation. But again, how did that – is that also an additional body as the hips are moving and things like that? So um, when you look into it, the, the shaft, the club head – the center of gravity, the, the mass of the club head, and the center of gravity of your hands are going to work to line up through impact. That's just kind of the physics behind it. So that's the reason why they can take put mass towards the heel to make more of that center of mass line up, and it rotates the club face and counterclockwise, which is, would produce a closed club face. So, like, if you slice the ball, you don't put the weight on the toe. You put it more closer to the heel. 
So the more mass you put towards the toe, obviously that pulls center of gravity mass out away from the shaft, which then does open the face like you're talking about. So then that would require more shaft rotation. So I would want to minimize that. Because again, when we look at it, you're talking, uh, I mean, milliseconds, a handful of milliseconds through impact. And once that ball leaves the face, nothing else matters. And really those force vectors that we can control are actually almost predetermined about 20 seconds, 20 milliseconds before we hit impact. We're, it's almost free flowing at that point. So it's, you have to hit a lot of balls if you have a lot of shaft rotation, you know, because that's practice, you know. So if you look at the old BJ Singh, I mean, hit thousands upon thousands of balls and you could time it up. So if you can reduce the amount of rotation and you have clubs designed with the proper center of mass, it, that's to me the perfect scenario. Yeah, I've had a lot of, rotation. Right, I've had a lot of success just feeling only this and this. One of the things that we use at our golf school, and uh, 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 one is coming up in Williamsburg, Virginia. There's information in the link. But uh, one of the things we use at the golf school is this. Um, I don't have it with me but is the yardstick feeling of just kind of spanking it like this yep. and not samurai sorting it or, or screwdrivering it, just unloading it kind of like that. Uh, but I have seen... Yep. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, that was fun. I have seen with... Um, when I play with uh, beginning golfers and stuff, though, they, they always say... Why do, why do beginning golfers uh, always seem to be leaving the face opening through impact, though, and then they get this slice? So then it's almost like you have to teach them this twisting closed or, or how do you teach uh, uh, a, a guy who has a major slice and you can tell because it's, it's just wide open through impact. Right. So there, a lot of it's the, what they were told to do before. So if they're told to kind of pull with the left side for right-handed golfers or their lead arm for, for either way, that's going to automatically, as I pull, face open. So then they have to use the hands at the bottom to kind of catch up. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to learn how to use your hands. But at some point, as we increase the speed, we, we want to look, get away from that. So that's kind of like beginner golf. Let's learn how to use the hands. Let's develop some proprioception, some awareness. But then we eventually want to go out of that and just get into more of the flexion extension. So it's, it's part of it is how you were taught. You know, if, if you taught the wrong grip, taught to pull with the lead arm instead of controlling the face with the back arm or trail arm. So uh, some of it's just programming. Yeah, uh, and that <clears throat> makes me think of my next, next question. Before I go on to the next question, I want to let everybody know we just announced it yesterday, but there's going to be a uh, Be Better Golf School in Williamsburg, Virginia, coming up in exactly one month. So you really uh, should strike on this soon. It is June 24th and 25th at the beautiful Golden Horseshoe Golf Club in Colonial Williamsburg, one of the top 100 uh, golf courses in the country, the gold courses. We're going to be at the green course, which is right next door, because that actually has a full tour-style practice facility and everything. It has a grass range, a short game area, and then also we get access to the green course uh, to play on as well. Tony will be there. Uh, Tony will be there, and to sign up, all you have to do is email me, bedivorce76 at gmail.com, and then I'll set you up with how to put in the deposit. It's going to be a very small school, so uh, we're really looking forward to some personal attention with you. Might be able to get Jeff Flagg out for it. It depends on uh, how many people we have signed up, really, and also his long drive schedule. So, uh, Tony, for my, my next question I have is when people – have gotten building your reactionary golf swing, which uh, is our video product. When people have gotten it, I get a lot of a lot of people understand that it's an arms first feeling, and that's explained really nicely in the video. One, but I get a lot of a, a lot of comments about okay, but what is the direction of the arms first? And I'm certainly getting a lot of things from this fad right now of laying the shaft off or shallowing the shaft in transition. What do you think is the direction the arm should take when we make this arms first feeling? It, based on, it obviously depends where you are in the backswing, but it's going to be somewhat of a diagonal forward type adduction motion. So it's this diagonal is kind of a diagonal down is probably the easiest way to describe it. Because when we look, 
even though the club had and the shaft do not stay in a constant plane going back, and there's a little bit of a, a semi-planar type motion, we eventually needed to get it on the plane, a functional swing plane by that clump through impact. So it's more, it is a tilted angle so that it would be a diagonal adduction motion of the right arm. Okay. So what do you think is the connection between making your back swing and then being able to correctly go down, out, and forward? A lot of people, me included, go take the, uh, the club kind of low and inside. And then from that point, is it like kind of where do you like to, to see the hands at the top? I think the easiest way of doing it is if you were going to just throw a ball, like throw a football or throw a baseball, that, that's where you just – there it is. There is the pack fully loaded. There's your uh, optimum position right there. I mean, yeah. that's how simple it is. You're not going to have it tucked in. You're not going to have it way out here. It, it's just right there, and that allows people – then what you have to do is balance in how does that, that lead arm work. Find that lead arm being a little bit bent just in order to help facilitate that right arm motion because if we can eccentrically load that right pack, we're going to have a lot more power coming down was a perfect example flying right elbow they said don't do it but he killed the ball i mean why would you not want to have jack nicholas's golf game <laughs> exactly uh -huh. there, there it is so i i it's you know biomechanically this is how it works so i every, every it just doesn't make sense why you would not want to just allow that to be free unless you have some rotator cuff issues but then you can modify that based on that you kind of have to find your position. There's kind of a range. Each golfer will have a range that's a little bit more comfortable for them in order to get both hands in position. So that's where you got to find it. But it's going to be somewhat throwing like. Okay. Which, uh, so that makes me think of uh, the right arm and the role of the right arm. Uh, for everybody who is uh, just logging in, we are doing a Be Better Golf Live kind of internet version. Tony is in Starkville, Mississippi. I'm in Long Beach, California, and you guys are all over the world. We have people from Sweden and England and San Diego, I can see, and somebody else from Long Beach and a bunch of other places. So uh, we're going to get to your questions coming up in just I, – I have two more things that people had written in already that I wanted to ask. So write your questions in there, and if you really uh, – if they kind of disappear, the Super Chat is probably the best way to make sure that your question will, will go through. One, uh, all right, so Tony, you're, the thing that you promote uh, more so than, than a any other instructor I've talked to is uh, trail arm control. So you were just talking about a lot of problems can happen from yanking or pulling or letting a lot of this front side pull it down. Why do you like right arm, for, we'll just talk in a right arm golfer kind of way, why do you like so much right arm control and and just like have the left arm just kind of on for the right well we have to take a look at the musculature that moves it so when i have a bent arm that's a shorter uh it's there's less moment of inertia i have a shorter radius now so it's easier to move so from that standpoint if i have my arm locked out straight it takes more muscular effort in order to move my hand in the golf club right so when we take a look, that deltoid, that posterior, anterior, and middle deltoid is the only, is this only muscle that can actually really pull the arm. You can pull the shoulder joint with the lat, but it's really, it's just, yeah. So when we take a look at the velocity of being able to do it, we have multiple levers with the right hand position, with the wrist being an extension. We have a shorter radius, so now... It's easier to move forward, so we can move it faster. And so that's the reason why we throw with the bent arm instead of throwing with the straight arm. So it's just biomechanically, we, we add multiple levers to the system. So a straight arm just takes more physical work to, to move it because it's a longer moment arm. Yeah, over on your channel, uh, everybody, if you just type in YouTube, Tony Lutzak, L-U-C-Z-A-K, uh, you'll see Tony's channel, and you should subscribe to his channel. But uh, over on your channel, you're doing something. Now, a lot of golfers uh, who are naturally left-handed play with righty equipment just because there's so much more righty equipment out there, and it's a lot cheaper and more available. So you see a lot of people have switched around 
So you see a lot of natural lefties that are playing right-handed and they have this strong front side. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing with another instructor and uh, maybe give us your preliminary findings or what should people do that, that are left-handed that are swinging right? Well, I mean, let, let's do a couple things. And I want to make sure we get to Jordan Huffman's question. He had an interesting point. We just need to clear up on, on something about the right arm. So okay, just remember that one. So uh, Brant Records, uh, teaching professional out of Windermere, outside Georgia. And what, he's a left-handed person but plays golf right-handed. Yeah. So what we're doing is a two-week case study, looking three days a week, about 40 minutes each session, doing feet-together drill, last week and then this week he's doing flamingo drill then we're going to test out the before and after based on club head speed and and all the numbers you know it's you know again when we look at a throwing motion and i know we're we're really honing in on this but this is just the, the essence of it see pretty good results uh because both those drills kind of force you and even some of the that was my thesis is my thesis is the emg work on the flamingo drill is we just see a higher level of activation in the in the pectoral muscles and when we see that we know that the arm is being more engaged and so we're going to see a, a higher rate and again the research is telling us validating all this so yeah I, we'll, we'll see where it goes but you know when it comes to human performance there's so much more involved than just a simple swing a golf club you know you got the mental component you got habits you got physical limitations so we'll see where he goes but I'm, I'm yeah one of the one of the articles that you had uh, shared on your twitter and i think was on your inside the golf lab was talking this scientist anthropology think anthropological scientist talking about how uh humans really athletically aren't very unique or very good and you know they're not the best in nature at anything they do there there's other animals that can twist faster there's other animals that can jump way further run way faster animals throughout uh the world can do you know there's animals that are even smaller than humans that are much stronger like a chimpanzee or something but one thing that humans do without a doubt way better than any other animal that's ever existed in history and this may be the reason that humans develop such big brains uh, or maybe the reason it was designed to develop, uh, whatever. But either way, the one thing that humans do way better than anybody is throwing, right? Is that right? Yeah, that that was a cool article. I mean, I didn't even think about it. I mean, that was our survival. You know, the invention of the spear to be able to 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 get our our food. Um, the throwing became the in the range of motion in that shoulder joint. I don't really. I don't think there are any other animals that are really designed that that do that as well as we do no like you like in the article it was saying like you go to any little league field in america and you'll have a kid throwing you know 60 miles an hour plus you know as a 13 year old right. and uh the fastest uh an ape can throw is like you know they just kind of go like that so this whole and this is really what we're talking about in the reactionary gosling this motion here from away from your body towards the center of your body and that's really what people are good at Exactly, exactly. So it's, it is a natural motion, uh, but because it's underhand and not overhand, this is where people do get confused about the arm swing and using the body and their coordination of body segments because they apply an overhand timing, which is more forward and over to an underhand sport. And that's just, yeah, there it is. They over the top and then they blame the right arm on, on it. And it's not the right arm's fault. It's just actually your left side is rotating out of the way. And, and obviously we have both sides of the body moving, but it's more of a body rotation that throws the club over the top, not the right arm at all. Yeah, at the beginning of this broadcast, we were talking a lot of people when they watch Building Your Reactionary Golf Swing, there's a link for it in the description below, and you guys can get a discount by emailing me, bdivorce 76 at gmail.com. But they were talking about the direction of it. So, yeah, if you think of it as in this diagonal kind of way, it kind of feels like – almost underhanded exactly yeah that's the reason why i kind of call it an underhand because people can relate to that if i say okay i want you to diagonally 80 duck your right arm coming down they're gonna go what yeah but if i say okay i want you to think of it as more of an underhand motion they go okay i know what underhand is i can pitch horseshoes and toss the ball underhand so there's that 
we built, we touch into their existing motor program on other things and just to t apply it and tweak it to the golf club. And that's what makes the, the learning process so much easier. That's what I found. Yeah. Just, you can go. You, there's no thoughts. You can just go with this feeling. All right. So let's get to your exactly. guys questions right now. We're going to first take our friend Jordan's question. Because Jordan was in the Be Better Golf School Indio. And so was Ian was in Be Better Golf School Indio. He's in the room. And, uh, and any questions you guys have, put them in the description below. Before we get to your questions, I do want to announce the one of the big reasons that we're doing this broadcast today is because exactly one month from now is the Be Better Golf School, the first ever one on the East Coast of America in Williamsburg, Virginia at the beautiful Golden Horseshoe Golf Club, June 24th and 25th, Saturday, Sunday. We're going to be going the thing. Now, uh, talk a little bit about our first golf school in Indio. Uh, Tony, and how, how was it different from most golf schools? We went pretty hard, didn't we? I, uh, I mean, we were on the range from, like, clock in the morning, break for lunch. And I remember staying out there. I think it was 6 o'clock. We were still a couple of the guys staying on the range trying to get everything dialed in. I know you and Jeff went out on the golf course. I mean, it was, uh, um, it was great. And that's the thing is, I mean, when people want to learn – then it's easier to for them to make the changes and understand it, you know. And that's that was the fun thing is we stayed out there all day, both days. Uh, practically, I know the second day we were out there doing the part three contest at night, practically. So, I mean, it was good two full days of golf information, golf instruction. That's what, what the cool thing was that I enjoyed. Yeah, uh, active 9x. Yes, it's a two day class, it's a uh in Williamsburg, Virginia, if uh, it'll start at about 8.30 in the morning, there'll be a presentation that'll go on for about 45 minutes. And then we're working from uh, basically from then all the way till four o'clock, we'll, you'll be able at 4 p.m. You'll be able to either go on the course if you want or stay on the range, keep working if you want. We'll kind of split the groups at that point. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun. It's basically like, Think of a tour player's off-season and what they would do when they're really ramping it up. That's basically what we're doing for two days is how it's been described to the other guys. Okay, uh, Tony, let's go to Jordan's question. You, you said Jordan had a question about the right arm, and you guys can write your questions in the in below. There's a lot of them coming in, so to make sure your question gets seen, uh, the Super Chat probably works the best. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, this is great. So, and I understand with what Jordan's saying, he's concerned that when you when you put the and get your right arm in a throwing position, wouldn't that put the shaft so far across the line it would be over your head? And actually, it would be, but we're not talking about the hand position. We're talking about the arm position. So he's right in a sense if we look at the hand position, but that's not what we're talking. What I'm referring to, I'm referring to the arm position. Now, when we put the left hand on the golf club. There is external rotation of the hand, and then that alters where the shaft is. So that's a that's a hand position or hand rotation, forearm rotation, the throwing motion with the right arm. So that's the only thing difference, Jordan. You got to be careful with that. Is you don't want to. It's not the hand position that we're looking for. It's the elbow position relative to the shoulder joint. And then we're going to see a little bit of that external rotation in that right hand, which does put the shaft position in a more in, you know, parallel to the target line. So that's part of the role of the left hand is to set that there. But we do want that elbow to kind of create a little bit of a stretch. And like I said, everyone's a little bit different. But, um, you know, Nicholas did it very, very well. And that's what we work on with Jeff, too. So and, and again, Everyone has to find their position. There's not one single position that fits everybody. Our ranges of motion are different for each individual. So you got to find your perfect position that works best for you. Yeah, when we talk about the, the right arm so much, it does bring up, okay, what is the role of the left arm? And in the stuff that we did with building your reaction and golf swing and working at the schools, really the, ro the role of the left arm that I've seen is – is not a, a power builder or a but it's more of something that gives your swing structure and allows you to if your left arm is working correctly it allows you the freedom to hit it super hard with the right arm 
Exactly, exactly. And and when you get the grip correct, and, and I'll be releasing that in June about how to really position your left hand, your lead hand, to make it more of a default fulcrum so it works. We need both arms because obviously I can't hit a ball as far one-handed as I can two-handed. So we need the whole system involved. But we don't we got to be careful that we're not trying to add in the wrong mechanics to the, the lead side versus the trail side. They each have their role, but once you get the lead side situated, you can almost let it go you know, and not worry about it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next question comes from Ann. Ann was also in our Indio school, Be Better Golf School out in the desert. And I think I'm pretty, I'm 90% sure that he's coming. He's going to be driving up for the, Virginia Golf School in a month. He's uh, still deciding, but Ann is wondering. He's having a. He says, I guess his question would be if he sets up with the left arm soft and it's still going straight at the like he it always just locks it out straight at the top of the backswing. Should he focus actively on breaking the left arm going back? You got to. You got to break it. You know, it's and it, and again, remember that the golf swing is a learned skill. So when we say things are natural and stuff like that, we still got to be careful even with that. Just there are things that are more habitual, but a straight left arm, we, we don't walk around with straight elbow joints, extended elbow joints. Everything's relaxed. I go pick up a, my glass of water here. My arm's bent. I didn't try to, you know, I'm not. It, so it's a learned skill and, and it's just a matter. And so there's a simple drill. You can actually just set the club on your right shoulder joint for a right-handed golfer. Get up a little bit, and there you go. Yep, put both hands on it there, Brennan. There it is. And I'll just push it away from you a little bit. You know, something like that to kind of just help. Oh, don't go straight, though. Don't okay. go straight on me. Just get a little whiff, yeah. Just, yeah, and then just push it up and away from you on a diagonal. Yeah, you'll just go up. There you go, yeah. And that just something like that to kind of help feel where that position is. There you go. Because it's not a width. We, we need some width going back, but there's also a height element to this, too. So we just got to play around with that to find each. You know, look at Bubba Watson, very high. Um, you know, Jeff, we work with Jeff, is trying to get high and wide. So that's a combination. And everyone, again, is a little bit different to find out where their best position is. And that's where I, I let our golfers decide that. Okay, uh, Stroker Ace 21 asks, how do I reduce the amount of timing needed to get the club face square? This is a perfect question for you, Tony, but one thing that uh, Monty used to say to me all the time, which was funny, was, uh, hey, if you want to make a million dollars in golf instruction, all you have to do is advertise the zero timing golf swing because uh, people are obsessed with not having to have timing. Uh, but yeah, his uh, Stroker's question is, how do you need to? How can you reduce the amount of timing needed to get the club face square? Well, there's a way to do that with uh, the reaction of your swing, isn't there? Uh, there's a couple of different ways. So understand that that it's an internal motor program. It's an ABC concept. It's simple as ABC: arms, body, and club through impact. And you have to feel that. So that's where we hit balls feet together and use a flamingo drill to help facilitate your feeling on how you're doing that. So um, look up the, I know Brendan's done, you've gotten done some great uh, production work on some of our stuff. Uh, the flamingo drill is probably one of the best videos that, that I think people are still talking about when they send me emails that they pick up from what, what we've done. So that, that to me is the best way along with the video uh, series, building your reactionary golf swing. But the golf swing is always timing. We always have to coordinate it, our arm motion, our body motion, the golf club. We can hit a perfect shot and miss hit the next one. So that sequence has to be as efficient as possible, and that's where the sequence of the arms, body, and club comes into play. And once you learn it, then you can start creating shots, and once those skills are developed, you're just golf, and you're not thinking about mechanics, and all of a sudden it just happens. Yeah, one of the things that Stroker's talking about is timing of the actual club face. So, so uh, there's the sequence, oh, but the, face. the, okay. of the club okay. face is kind of this motion, isn't it? Yeah, so I prefer, and we were working on this yesterday uh, with one of my students, uh, Maddie, is, is really trying to set the right wrist into extension. So this is extension, 
and that's flexion. So if I keep the face square to its path, that's extension going back. There's less rotation I need coming through. So you have to take a look. I use checkpoints. You could call them positions, but I use them more as checkpoints. So when the shaft's parallel to the ground, where is the club face? Is it toe up or is it a little bit toed down? A little bit toed down, which is square to its path. Good position at the top. And then it just comes back down and through. So that way you don't have to have shaft rotation coming down. So that would require less timing. That's my preference. You have to take a look at grip alignment. Make sure your right hand and left hand are both in the proper position. Because if the right hand's too much on top, that's actually going to naturally open up the face. So you have to look at grip alignment, how you take the club back, and then how you sequence it down in order so you don't have to rotate the shaft. Gotcha. Okay, uh, back to my questions. All right, what questions have you gotten since we put out building, the rea building Your Reactionary Golf Swing and you've seen a lot of these Be Better Golfers swings sent to you? What do you think um, is a common hurdle for people to change from whatever they were doing to the Reactionary Golf Swing? Or what are some common stuff that you're seeing with it? Uh, this has been the fun part. I mean, <laughs> this, this, this is where uh, it's been great to get these emails. I've had a lot of swing thoughts. I've cut those down to only one or two, and I'm hitting the ball further than ever with less effort. It's pretty much the whole essence of all these. The ball's going further, taking less work, and it's simple. And that's where, you know, it's just been great to hear. I mean, I've known this stuff works, but all of a sudden now to be able to put it out in video and pull it, pull it out in the masses, to have people do it without me being there, and taking these drills and applying this, it's been fun. It's been a lot of, I've uh, seen a lot of success with it. 30 yards, 40 yards more distance with some tee shots. Um, handicaps, scores going down five, six shots around. Handicaps going down. Um, it, it's been awesome. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the things that you guys can look forward to exactly a month from today. I keep advertising this, but... Uh, <laughs> it's very, very difficult for us to get a second, uh, actually a third, Be Better Golf School going. We did our first one in India, our second kind of 1.51 in Long Beach. And uh, those were easy to set up because I'm physically in this location. Uh, remotely calling golf courses and just telling them, hey, I do a YouTube channel and I want to bring in uh, a golf instructor from a different state to teach students. Uh, everybody thinks they're, you're crowding their territory or something, so it's very difficult to get a golf course. But luckily, I have family in Williamsburg, Virginia, one of the most beautiful places in the country, I think. And uh, uh, they uh, had some connections at a at the Golden Horseshoe there, which is uh, I got to talk to Glenn and Eric, the head pro, and they're super, super excited. They even said to me, they're like, one of the first things they said to me, they're like, so uh, can this? you think this could be a yearly thing where you guys come here? And I said, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Like so that. uh, that'd be great. But the one challenge with it, and this is the reason I keep telling you guys about it, is that uh, we only had it. Uh, we, we only have a month to go until our date. The first Be Better Golf School had about four or five months before it went. So now we're just down to one month. I didn't want to push it further into the summer because the weather there can get insanely hot, and also with uh, Tony's school schedule. So it's happening. June 24th and June 25th, Williamsburg, Virginia, to get on the list, and there's already a few people on the list, and it's going to be a very small school, email me, bedivorce76 at gmail.com. Tony, uh, have you been able, now that uh, school has calmed down just for a few weeks, have you been able to play more golf yourself personally? Um, more playing lessons. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've been out there. You know, it's, it's, it's good to be back back playing my short game is very rusty right now putting's good full swing is good but those touch shots around the greens uh they're rusty right now yeah it's good working there i'm still working on comps i got comps next month before the golf school so i'm still studying i'm writing um i'm actually writing the teacher certification program so i'm working on that so 
really school hasn't stopped for me, but it's been good to uh, be outside cooperating down here. And we got, you know, a bunch of lessons coming in. So uh, juniors were out playing golf. So it's good. It's good to be back on the golf course. Uh, one question just came in about the, the wrist cock. A lot of teachers teach on the way up a kind of a thumbs up kind of feeling. And uh, how, is that how is that different from what you want to do? Well, if you take a look at the left hand, the left hand does its radial and ulnar deviation is the motion. So that, yeah, the left hand is more up and down. The application of force from the arms into the, the club and into the ball. So if I set the club up right behind the ball and I vertically unhinge and unhinge my wrist straight up and down, will the club head ever hit the ball? That's sideways. Oh, okay. So Vertically hinge and unhinge. Like if you're just doing this. Yeah. So will I ever hit the ball? No, you'll be one inch behind it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that force never hits the ball forward. No. You can't hit the ball forward. So biomechanically, that's impossible. Now, so that's the key point. The reason why we have to use more of the right hand horizontally through impact. And the vertical comes more in the backswing and in your transition. Delivery into the ball is not a vertical motion. It's a horizontal motion. You've got to have a linear component with through impact, at least six inches. If everything is angular and everything's up and down, you're not putting force of the club into the ball. It's just biomechanically impossible. Okay, so uh, can – what if you're let's talk about the short game because it, it's kind of a uh, its own animal in a lot of ways and uh it, it the short it kind of seems like with the full swing you can you can get a good idea and in your head and like it can click and you're like you're on it you're like you're a new golfer sometimes right but with the short game there's just no way around just getting out there and doing it huh yeah, exactly. You got to get out there and practice. And actually, my philosophy with the short game of practicing is a little bit different than what we'll see on the on the driving range. Mechanisms are the same, but I like to create a lot of different shots. More of a random practice instead of block practicing up on the range. The good thing about it, when we take a look at how the golf club is designed, if I allow that wrist to hinge ex through extension going back, so I keep it on a nice arc how the club head is designed in balls and one of the things i challenge a lot with my juniors is how many shots can they hold from around the green if they read the green correctly they move the right wrist correctly for right-handed golfers we should be able to get the ball to always go towards the target and for example with maddie um yesterday we were working on and he was up in vermont and he's got a simulator so at what distance can he keep the ball within one yard of the target line? And just working off this hinge motion, extension, deflection, and he got it up to about 70 yards, 80 yards. But, and that's the thing we, I like about the foresight unit is indoors, is we can try to get zero side spin or zero axis tilt with, with our wedges and then start building that up into the full swing. And all of a sudden now it becomes almost automatic and now you can just control distance. So the same technique, but I like random practice versus block practice for the short game. Yeah, Tony teaches uh, – Matty, is it Duple? I think that's how it's pronounced. I'm not, yeah. I'm not good with the, 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 the kind of South French, South African uh, right. pronunciation. So t Tony teaches Maddie Duplay, who is a uh, golfer, probably, I think he's, is he 13 or 14 now? 13. 13 year old golfer in Vermont who uh, became really well known for going into, uh, he was uh, hired by somebody when he was like 11 or 12, no, I think like 10 or 11, to interview Tiger Woods in, at a press conference. And, every, and he, everybody got to know him there. Now he has over, I think, 30,000. Instagram followers and also a few thousand on YouTube and he is sponsored by Bridgestone and Under Armour and a really uh, dedicated golfer but uh, I'm really excited that he's working with you Tony because uh, he contacted me a, a long time ago after I did my interview with uh, Gigi Swing Tips who is more of a leg-based body-based uh, kind of loading and thrusting kind of move 
uh, he contacted me and said, "Hey, uh, do you think I should go with him?" And I said, "And I said, well, with your move, I would talk to this other guy in Mississippi who who I who I really like, and that may have been the the uh, genesis for the connection. But the reason I'm excited for him to work with you is because." He really does have this desire. You can see at the top of his swing, and you guys can see his swing on Instagram if you go to, I think it's MD18 uh, 18 under par, under par uh, yeah. on Instagram. Anyway, so uh, you can really see he has this desire to lunge with the body that a lot of young kids, when they start really early, want to do. Huh? Yeah, and that's one of the hardest things to kind of get him out of that habit. And now, finally, we're, we're, we're seeing that disappear. You know, and he used to try to lay off the shaft, drop it underneath, Sergio-type move, and went to – exactly. And, and it just was so inconsistent. And, and, and I think that's the reason why Sergio struggled. Well, I know it's why Sergio struggled. Because, again, the way I view things and the research that other researchers have done, golf researchers have done, We've, they've modeled out the swing. I'm modeling out the EMG stuff. They've modeled out the biomechanics of the club head movement. So when we put all that together, we know what's efficient and what's inefficient. We don't need to look at what a player's history is and what, you know, we, that's, that's playing the game. We're looking at it from the swing, and then we allow the player to maximize their talents to make it the best that they can do. They can do. So there's really not a whole lot of guessing anymore. Okay, a quick thing about the short game. Uh, uh, Bobby Lopez, a, a friend of mine who's been on the channel, uh, got to spend uh, a few years with Seve Ballesteros' brother and a few months with Seve himself on the European tour. And uh, Bobby and Seve used to always get in arguments about the right arm, uh, especially with the short game. Uh, okay. Seve loved this extension feeling here. Yep. And uh, Bobby was very traditional in the rolling kind of feeling, uh, toe, toe up. But, uh, and then in the Masters this year, we saw Nick Faldo when they were uh, talking about Seve, somebody was hitting, hitting a short game shot. Seve used to also get in this argument with Nick Faldo where uh, it would be, he would say, the, the right arm is my magic arm. That's how he could create all those different shots right. also throughout his whole bag. So, uh, and now that he's older, uh, Bobby has said, like, he realized the whole time Seve was correct because he's doing that now. <laughs> but uh, tell us about the short game feeling of right here and kind of like the magic move almost in, in the right arm in short game. I, I think, that, Brendan, you're, you're showing it practically perfect. When you take that grip and you go into extension and that shaft gets parallel to the ground, hidden shots with the right hand only. That that's it right there. I mean, now you can create every single trajectory you want. At lower, you can adjust the ball position and and just hold that angle a touch longer with that right wrist. You know, keep it into extension. Now, let's say you want to kind of flip it up a little higher. Now you let that go through. Let that get into flexion. So when we look at it, I try to be very symmetrical. And my right wrist will go into extension on the way back, and my left wrist will go into extension on the way through. So now that face stays very square to its path, and I don't I can become a lot more accurate ball closer to the hole. Okay, um, Paxton Jarrett is wondering, and uh, guys, why don't, why don't everybody put in the comments, it would be interesting for me to see where in the world you are. Like, I'm in California, United States, Tony's in Mississippi. Uh, so... Paxton is wondering where his weight should be on the driver. Should he? He's saying specifically, should his weight feel uh, a lot in his heels when hitting driver? Well, we want weight to be moving. Weight and what we feel is pressure in our feet are more of our neuromuscular adjustment to control our coordinated body motion. So that being said, it, to work into the heel of right-handed golfer in the back swing. It transition towards your left big toe. Next time you're kind of your swing methodology, or I shouldn't say your shot pattern, is then once it goes towards the toe, it's going to come back, hook back down into the heel, and that, that kind of produces a draw. So if you want, and I know um, I was asking if the swing methodology was a draw. I uh, just kind of, we can go two for one there, Kim. Scott Alexander. 
So if we go heel to left toe, yeah, that will produce more of a draw. If we go heel or maybe midfoot to the toe and that arm swing becomes a little bit more straight, then that, that would be a straight shot. So I wouldn't say that the method produces a draw, but you can adjust your body position and your arm swing alignment to create every shot possible with the same sequence. Yeah, in the video series that we did, Building Your Reactionary Golf Swing, uh, Scott and everybody else, there's a, there's a whole section on creating shots, and you basically create those shots with your alignments and your uh, at address. And uh, there's just a kind of this practice station that you set up, and you can kind of almost, if you set this practice station up, you'll find yourself very easily hitting draws and uh, push draws and pull cuts and basically the nine different windows. So that's in building your reaction or golf swing. Uh, people are logging in with where they're watching in Fort Lauderdale, Buffalo, New York, Sacramento, Temecula, Dover, New Hampshire, uh, England. Uh, one question from England, John Ruskin is asking. Okay, so what is the difference in release with irons and with driver? Uh, what do you oh, suggest? that's a great – yeah, I love that, John. That's a great question. Yeah, what do you suggest for releasing the wrist at impact with driver versus irons? It's totally different. It has to be. Why? Because the driver and the irons are designed differently. So when we look at the design of the golf club, the shaft of a driver is behind the face. We look at the design of an iron, that shaft is leaning forward in front of the face. So your wrist motion will be different at impact. We don't want a forward leaning shaft with the driver, so that release is that club head's going to come into the ball in front of the hands. That's perfect. So even though it's a, it's the same motion, they just occur at different times. Irons that release that straightening of the wrist happens beyond the ball. With the driver, it happens before the ball or at the ball, even though it's the exact same motion driving through. So that's the reason why. This, you can use this methodology for all different shots and all different clubs. So sometimes you'll see people, especially people that were obsessed with lag, uh, trying desperately to hold it on the way down. And then uh, what, what effects can that – and then will they need to almost feel more of this going through with driver? Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I have a tendency for me to just hang on to it with my short irons. And I'll hit my sand wedge just so low. It's like, okay, got to let it go. And I feel like I'm actually hit, swinging my wedges like a driver to do that. So, yeah, there's a lot of thought about, should I, you know, handle, drag it? Well, that's good for the shots. And that's the reason why I want people to realize they can create different shots with one swing. How those wrists are working, how you deliver that club head into the ball. So, yeah, if you're kind of used to that, dragging the handle in front of it, yeah, let that club head release, you know. And I hate to really – release is not the right word, but I get it. So it's, it's just moving from extension into flexion. We're not letting go of anything, but that's just me being academic snob. Yeah, yeah get it. Yeah, be active with it. Um, yep. All right, here's a question from me. Uh, I think this is someone just trying to get my attention, but – Brendan, how did you become such a good putter? You seem to make a ton of putts on your vlogs. Yeah, I am a, uh, like I tell Tony, I am a very good putter, and I will keep telling that to anyone who'll listen because it just helps me be even better. But um, something, I was going through my stats recently, and uh, I was watching some of my really old vlogs, whereas the thing that, the, the main, the thing that I can do almost at a poor player level is, uh, like 15 feet and in, maybe even 20 feet and in. I make like an inordinate amount of those, especially like eight footers and stuff. I make a lot of those. And uh, there's, there's reasons that I became really good, good at that. One reason, I think, is that I've never, ever putted. Uh, I've never putted traditionally. I've only ever putted left-hand low. It's how I learned. And if you talk to uh, – and if you talk to – Gary Player and Arnold Palmer used to both say that they thought that if you were going to teach somebody right off the bat, that's how they would teach them. And uh, Tony's left hand low as well. And my brother Dustin, who taught me originally how to play golf, is left hand low. And he just, I just thought that's, that's how you putt. You know, similar to you take your glove off when you putt, I thought you, you put it cross hand. And I thought that, that was it. But in looking at my stats, I can see I'm very far away from a tour level putter when it comes to the 60-footers 
and the 50 footers and, and things like that. I don't get it as close as they do from those distances. I'm still leaving myself so many, and this is maybe one of the reasons I'm such a good eight foot putter is because from far away, I'm still leaving myself seven, eight, 10 feet sometimes to save my par. And uh, that is the, the stat that I would really love to have of a PGA Tour Pro right now more than almost anything else is I remember in 2010, John Rollins, when he was playing really well, uh, broke a streak. I think he went something like, I don't, something ridiculous, something like 500 or almost 1,000 holes without a three putt. Now, some of that statistically wow. is because of he's hitting it so close all the time. But regardless, I mean, that, that is just something that uh, Brian Gay, who watches the channel, he, he, goes, he goes scores and scores and scores of holes without free putting. And uh, I think the reason is he's just leaving himself um, distance control so good. So I know that Tim Yelverton, who is helping with the channel, is going to be doing a video kind of for me specifically that is going to be released on the channel. He's going to be filming oh, good. About, uh, about long legs. So, uh, yeah, so one of the things is I just got, I got really good at it. And uh, from, Tony, why do you do left-hand low? Were you always, or you switched over? No, in junior college, I was struggling my first year at junior college and just, uh, just putting horrendously. And I went to, tried left-hand low, and I started making putts. So, obviously, I stayed with it. And then I remember talking to Dave Pals. Uh, he offered me a job a couple times, but. Him and I could not – I didn't agree with the 17 inches past the hole, and I just didn't – just couldn't commit to that. And But we were talking about the left-hand low allows that lead arm to be nice and straight and relaxed, and in a sense, it gets out of the way. The other thing I like about it is, again, I'm a big believer that there's not a lot of shaft – or face rotation, shaft rotation with the putter through impact. So I kind of create this flat spot where the shaft moves very laterally through impact. With It's not arcing at all. And I know Nicholas was a big believer in making sure that that toe of the putter never crossed over the heel, at least through impact. He felt that heel led the way. That was just some of the little things that I read. So when I put went to left hand low, I felt like I was pushing a little bit. And then later on, I think even Dave Stockton had Rory doing that for a while. And I just feel like that's the best way to putt. When I, I see that in your putting stroke, through impact, that face, that shaft isn't rotating, so that ball's always going straight. And once you develop your speed control, now it's just automatic as long as you read it correctly. Yeah, one thing that I do with putting that uh, I, I did even before I met you, but I don't know why, is, is sometimes I'll, I'll do this where I stand up and I put my finger on it here, and this is basically the, the, the motion that I like to feel. Yep. So, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Okay, so uh, yeah, every a lot of the people who are watching now are, are off of work and they're watching the PG, the PG tour go off. We're gonna do this for uh, six more minutes and then and then we're gonna log off. Um, the key the, is the confidence in your putter. That's my nephew Jack, who we'll see in Virginia. Um, thanks for your explanation. I always felt I had to hold on longer to get. A great release with driver. Well, that's going to be so. So a lot of this is not like a prescription that everybody takes, huh? Like some people are going to feel different things. But what are some of the common right. things that that are what what common things you can see that everybody should be doing in the golf swing or thinking of? Um. Oh, geez. Well, obviously, good sequence is good timing is good rhythm. That. You know, even if we take any position at the top, if you can coordinate everything coming down properly, you're going to hit the ball better. Um, alignment is a big issue. And I see misalignment causing more swing faults than, than anything. So a lot of times people line up to the right of the target then have to adjust and resequence their swing and throw their body around in order to try to pull the club back to the ball, back to their target because they're lined up incorrectly. So those are things to watch out for. Um, I would also say grip, making sure that the grip is in a good position that you can make the delivery of the golf club as simple as possible. And, uh, you know, that 
I, I would say in a nutshell is really all you have to do. I think a lot of the other stuff that people think about is just too extraneous. It's just like, why? Why do that? You know, why be that mechanical? We got, you know, you got 250 milliseconds on the way down to hit a golf ball. By the time we recognize uh, kind of like a fault and then we're able to react to it, it takes us between 100, and 100 to 200 milliseconds for the human body to process that information. It's over with. So if you start the downswing incorrectly, you're really just trying to save it. So that transition is critical, and that's the reason why the sequence that we talk about with the arms and body and club, to me, is the essence of reactionary golf and the essence why people do get better and can simplify this, their golf swing. One thing I wanted to ask you, too, Tony, so let's imagine a golfer. This, this comes from uh, El Dorado. I don't know if he's, if he's in my area, but that's, that's the golf course I play at. But um, one, one, imagine there's a golfer that their, their swing seems very good, and I, I see this a lot, but they just don't have speed. It just and you can tell they're athletic and they're, you know, they're, you know, they would be able to generate it, but they're just kind of seems like they're waving at it and they're not really. What are some of the things you do to build up golfer speed? Well, I I like to take like I'll use PVC pipe or you can flip the golf club around the driver and swing right hand only, right handed golfer, left hand only, left hand fast don't be afraid to start swinging fast because you have to mentally be prepared to go fast fast arms fast body fast feet fast golf club so you have to approach it that way so like if you were to sprint we want fast arms so i can move my legs faster you can't sprint with slow arms or you can't sprint sprint very fast so if you were to do a marathon, you're not going to have your arms pumping. That wastes too much energy. You want a long endurance. But on a sprint, we want fast arms, fast body. So you have to train yourself to go fast. A heavy club is not going to help you go faster. Swinging weighted clubs is not going to help you go faster. You can take some longer. I use like a five-foot PVC pole and get people to swing that. You know, and, and orange whip is, to me, a little bit too, too heavy. Um, but but something like that. And I know, uh, I think, uh, Brandon, your friend had one. And I know Jeff was practicing with it a little bit. Uh, but just fast arms, fast body, fast golf club, and a fast mindset, too. You can't be afraid to go. It's a speed accuracy trade-off. And actually, I just shot a video on this the other day. I haven't posted it yet. That'll be in June. It's called speed accuracy trade-off and neuromotor control. I have to train fast and not worry about accuracy. If I think about accuracy, I'm going to slow down. If I think about mechanics, I'm going to slow down. In order to go fast, I have to be free and not be afraid that the ball is going to go offline. And if your mechanics are good, grip, takeaway, sequence, you can go as fast as you want. Okay, let's briefly talk about uh, chipping and, and pitching. Do you like to, do, to control everything with just traje trajectory? Or do you like to hit spinning chip shots and kind of put some stop into it that way? Um, I would say I know what I like to do, so I'll kind of answer two different ways. Um, I prefer to use one club and just tweak the, the loft a little bit on it, one or two clubs, and then create my shots that way. I also see there's nothing wrong with using a lot of different clubs to create that. Most golfers would probably be better off not worrying about spin, you know, that use trajectory to control how much spin you have because a spin, a lot depends on the ball you're using, the turf you're playing off of. And if you got a lot of grass in there, you're not going to be able to get a lot of spin because you get that, that grass material in between the club face and ball. So I, I would say control trajectory first learn how to do that, and then you can add in spin after that based on right conditions. Tour players, on tour, it's easy to. Those fairways are tight, firm, generally speaking, and, and the equipment they're using, the ball spins more. All right, so uh, guys, we're just about wrapping up here. So any final thoughts, you can put it in. It's, it's noon now, and we're just about to wrap up. We've been doing this for about an hour and 15 minutes, and could probably continue on, but oh, I do have a yeah. really important question for you, Tony. That uh, yes. I wondered for a long time. 
Uh, before I get to that question, I want to let everybody know we're exactly one month away. Let's let me see here. Yeah, it's well, we're a little less than actually. Uh, it's May 26th now, but on June 24th and 25th in Williamsburg, Virginia, at the Golden Horseshoe Golf Club, is the Be Better Golf School, Williamsburg, with uh, Tony Lutzak and I, and possibly if there's enough people, Jeff Flay, um, the World Long Drive Champion of 2014. And uh, it's going to be a really exciting two days of golf at one of the best practice facilities on the East Coast. Uh, it's really an amazing place, totally secluded in the uh, very thick woods, uh, which will be good in case it's hot. But also, uh, it's got a full uh, short game area that's just for us, full range that's just for us, and then we get full access to the golf course each afternoon. Sign up for it by going to bedivorce76 at gmail.com. Email me. There's a link for it in the description below. Tony, uh, all right, you, when you talk about sequence, you talk about ABC, Arms Body Club. But one of the teachers, a uh, top 100, actually top 50 teacher in the country that I talked to, a guy that is a uh, one of the is the leading guy in the golfing machine. Uh, he says it's not just arms body club; it's really just from the top moving the the. Cl Why do you say arms body club and not just take it to the top and let in a Jim Flick kind of way let the club head just lead everything? Why is it arms body and then club? Why isn't it just club head straight from the top? Uh what if you don't move your body now here's where we got to be careful because again everyone can have different habits some people get more centered some people people pivot properly what i try to do is if i just let the club head go and i i keep my body stationary because again how people filter this information you never know and i say okay well, i'm just want the club head to move and i don't move my body my right arm my right shoulder joint stops yeah. I got to keep that right shoulder joint moving. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, it's got to be hip extension and a pivot into my front foot. And so that now I know my upper body does the rotation. Lower body is not designed to rotate. It's designed to pivot and to post. So I want my upper body to rotate in order to help deliver the speed of my right arm in the club into the ball better. I can create some flat spots through impact and keep it a little bit more lateral, which again, makes it a more accurate swing. So what do you see? I, I just, yes. What are you seeing the problem is when, when people go to the top and just try to lead only with the, um, lead only with the club head? Yeah, so if you look at what you just did right there, nothing moved on the way down. I know you're sitting down, but that's what people will end up doing is because they'll take a, a comment, club head only. I'm not going to move anything else. And I've seen this. It's like they stopped moving their body completely because of practice. That's what they thought they had to do. If I just say, okay, well, I want, you know, we want everything working in the golf swing, right side, left side, upper body, lower body, everything. So I have to coordinate that. So how can we deliver a message that hits, you know, 95% of the people? And it, it's just that coordination between arms, body, and club. And that's, I need everything moving to kind of cover all bases. Yeah, that was the, the thing for me that I was so hard going with the body. And then through kind of what Maddie's doing right now, the feet together, flamingo drill, I got pretty good at getting the arms more synced up. But then when we met up, and uh, this is the thing with the reactionary golf swing. It's an arms first feel, but not an arms only feel. When we met up, it was right. actually punch shots and uh, punch shots and almost a, a, a shaft getting on top of myself kind of way, kind of almost like this. But, it, but to get my lower body to start actually, okay, I had a, like you said, I have a license to use my lower body at this point. Right. Yeah, we got to use everything if we're going to maximize our, our accuracy and our distance. Yeah, and you guys, the, the thing that I like the most about getting together with Tony to do the Building Your Reactionary Golf Swings uh, video series, some of you guys have it. Uh, the rest of you, anybody who doesn't have it, you can email me, bdivorce76 at gmail.com. I'll give you a special discount uh, for it. Uh, but the thing I really liked about getting together to do that is we really got to get more in-depth with the, the role of the lower body. So many people are going so hard with the lower body that – I don't know, a high percentage of people need to feel more upper body, but then at some point we can use the lower body fully, super hard. And, and it's detailed really nicely in that video. I, I watched it myself 
a lot before I practice. But uh, Tony, tell everybody about the Be Better Golf School Williamsburg one final time, and then we'll, we'll get up. What, it's, when is it? What are you looking forward to? June, June. So we got June 24th, 25th. It's going to be a great weekend. Be prepared to learn a lot. Be prepared to, to kind of find out how simple the game actually can become. The point of all this is, yeah, I can talk about science, neuromechanics, biomechanics, cognitive engineering, the whole thing. But that's not what we do from a learning process. When we want to play our best golf, we have to learn how to rewire ourselves so we can just freely create shots. And it's that creativity that allows you to become the best golfer you can possibly be. So we use the science as our basis to understand how systems work, but you're not going to learn the systems. You don't want to learn the systems. The best golfers in the world have the least amount of thoughts. That's what reactionary golf can help you do is simplify the swing in such a way so you don't have to just think, think, think your way on mechanics around the golf course, and now you can play great golf. Yep, and that's the reason that – be Better Golf School is powered by Reactionary Golf. I really think it's uh, the uh, best way to get to get better really quick and just also to have more fun on the golf course. You're not thinking and, uh, oh, exactly. and just, you know, putting yourself into a mental pretzel every time you're standing over the ball. So uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And um, I really appreciate everybody logging on to this video, subscribing to the channel, click like and subscribe to this video. Like I said, we have the two things we're talking about today is building your reactionary golf swing, link below, and also Be Better Golf School Williamsburg, which is coming up on June 24th and 25th. Thanks everybody for watching. Bye. Thanks guys, appreciate it.